this little talk is one that I gave at the uh, Chromatic Weekend uh, a few years ago now. Um, and uh, at that time it was much more practical based. Um, uh, we won't really be able to do some of the exercises we did at the Chromatic Weekend uh, with Zoom online. So it's largely going to be chat, but I do hope to play you a tune or two just to make sure the harmonica still remains at the centre of our preoccupations. Now, um, Pete said that uh, he gave a reminder at the coffee morning, which I couldn't go to, um, and that I'm going to vaccinate you all against stage fright. Uh, it's going to be a new Harmonica UK campaign, and um, the, um, uh, the, the serum is being prepared as we speak. So what's this really all about? It's really more about how to get the best out of your performance. Um, I don't want to emphasize too much the rather uh, scary notion of uh, performance um, nerves, uh, but we will look directly at that at, very, at various points. The positive take on the whole thing is really how to keep those things under control which may stop you from really making the very best out of your performance. Now I'm hoping that during the course of the talk um, people will be able to share some of their experiences. Now because um, some of these things are vulnerability experiences, you know they're like times when you've not been happy, um, I think we'll all make a mental note, though it's good to have a laugh, and I will be jollying us along at various points. Um, be, be careful if people, you know, tell us a serious story about some upset they had when they were performing. Let's all uh, be socially minded and not throw tomatoes. Now, um, how am I qualified to talk about this? Well, I have been playing harmonica a long, long time. And that's my latest record behind me, Chromacto, um, which I haven't released quite in the flamboyant fashion of Pete Hewitt, because um, I haven't really been made make up my mind what to do with it in the um, in the um, lockdown. But if people want to send me their email address on the chat line, I'll send you a couple of um, you know a couple of free tracks, uh, and I'll be selling the album at ten quid a go later on. Um, and I've played in various settings. When I was at work, which was in the health service, uh, I had a folk blues duo um, for about 10 years. And we used to do people's barbecues and play at folk clubs and stuff like that. It was mainly finger style guitar and harmonica. Um, and um, more latterly, I have played in a five piece jazz band with, with harmonica and also saxophone at the front. Um, I do quite a bit of singing and playing at open mics, but not, as you know, recently. So, um, what's this all about then? Well, I'm going to show you some, some, uh, some slides. Okay, here we go. The show must go on. So it's really about performing with confidence, how to get the best out of what you know. And... Um, in order to explore this area, we're going to talk about performance anxiety, how to master it, but more importantly, probably, how to prevent it. Now, harmonica players are generally hobbyists and amateurs, although there is a small, prestigious professional circle of players that we all know and love and admire. Um, uh, but this whole idea of performance anxiety is actually fantastically important in professional music. Fantastically important. Um, uh, because the situations where it's most likely to be stressful for a performer are where there's some, some kind of uh, value, some kind of expectation, maybe even your living is in, uh, in the balance. Um, and that may seem strange to a harmonica player who maybe goes to a Celtic session like a blues jam where it's all very relaxed and you have a pint 
and you get up and you know you play a song that you're very familiar with but it, just imagine what it must be like to to to, to play a classical piano at the Beethoven competition in Moscow um absolutely unbelievably nerve-wracking and why should it be nerve-wracking well it's not just because you'll have an audience um it's not because your teacher might criticize you but it's also because your whole career might depend on it if you look at the um cv of nearly all star performers in the classical world you'll see that they've nearly all won prestigious competitions in the early stages of their career so those of us who've all got up at the stage at the uh, harmonica uk festival in the competition we've been taking part in a really important tradition in the whole of music competitions have gone back hundreds and hundreds of years so that's just what one example it might be the one that people are most familiar with so in this my view what's most important about music uh, is to play for the love of it um, and as uh, Rostopovich said perfect technique is not as important as making music from the heart it's easy to forget if you're spending hours practicing a piece um, that you should be uh, that it's better and more enjoyable to do it for the love of it um, now what lies at the heart of people getting stressed and nervous about a performance is your concern about the outcome of the performance usually it's the case that we all kind of exaggerate in our minds the importance of um, the performance that you're going to make in all my time I've never actually seen a real rotten tomato you know, um, people and audiences are generally actually really kind but you do notice a negative reaction very often because it often takes the form of people simply not complimenting you or not commenting on your performance it's much less likely that anybody would ever make a negative comment to a performer it's just really not socially acceptable is it but the performer themselves is nearly always very very focused upon the results and the reaction of people to to what you're playing and uh, so if you notice people blank you and you know don't make any comment you're usually probably correct in interpreting it as being negative now if you look at this slide this is a slightly exaggerated version of um the situation that we'll all face if you sign up for the competition at the um, annual festival or maybe a recording session because uh, if you're spending a lot of money on a recording session and i know pete hewitt's recently done this um uh, if you're spending a lot of money on musicians and booking time then um uh, you can get quite wound up and if you're um you've got a limited amount of time and you're standing in front of the microphone uh and you count in a song one of the things that can happen if you start, if you're feeling a bit wound up and nervous is you're counting too quick i mean that's like an absolutely notorious thing that happens when people are feeling wound up and nervous is that you count up too quick and if you count in your song too quick um most of it may be okay but then there'll be some corner there'll be some little section which you haven't practiced at that higher tempo on my record there's a song a lovely song by stevie wonder called seduke and uh in the middle of seduke there's an interlude um which is a really rapid fire passage ba ba do ba do ba ba do da ba ba de do ba 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 do da ba do ga like that and um the beginning of the song starts off with da ba 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 so when you count it in you have to go one two three four ba ba da ba because if you go faster than that when you get to the interlude it's impossible to play it's you know it's far too fast so that's just a little example of how being 
in control, being centered and calm at the point of the beginning of a song is going to be really important. So take a look at this little diagram. You get the news that the gig is booked. And of course, everybody's really pleased. Wow, I've got a gig, especially 2020 during lockdown. That would be marvelous, isn't it? I've got a gig. And uh, the first thing that happens is manic preparation. So you're all excited and you start getting out the charts and and making lists of the songs that you want to play. And um, and then um, it gets closer to the date and you start finding that you're feeling a bit restless at night. You don't get enough sleep. You're feeling tired during the day. Of course, you've got a day job. You haven't got much time to practice. And uh, then you go into what's called a period of denial. Well, that means that you tell yourself, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be marvellous. Um, it'll be fine. And then after a little bit of time, you look at the calendar and you realise, oh, it's only two weeks, you know, to the gig. And we haven't got the rehearsal in yet. We haven't agreed all the songs. Then you have more manic preparation, more restless nights. Then, of course, you have a total nervous breakdown when the bass player rings up to say that he unfortunately uh, uh his, his his lady wife is going into hospital to have a baby and he can't come to the gig and you can't find another bass player so you spend all your time ringing round instead of practicing the songs you know the story so um at the end of it we have these very scientific thing which is called last ditch efforts to calm the fuck down when it's all over and it's been an inevitable total success then of course you want to do it again and you repeat the whole painful process once more so what is the enemy then here he is um what are the effects of performance anxiety so one is a sense of dread um that means you start thinking that bad things are going to happen um what those bad things are are usually somehow you'll let the side down there'll be some bad reaction or the rest of the band will be browned off with your performance these are the sorts of um things which fuel the sense of dread some people may feel shaky and uh, you know even get a little bit of tremor with their hands wobbly legs you'll be aware of your heart beating very fast now the these signs usually occur just before or in the few hours that are building up to performance but um the people who experience this and i i have and i can tell you a little bit about those situations later um it may come on uh weeks before wear off come back but it may interfere with your quality of life it may also interfere with your pr preparation for the performance so the idea behind this slide is to help people to recognize um what these sensations can really feel like at this point i'd like to ask um uh, are people familiar with these kind of sensations and experiences or has anybody uh, experience them themselves yeah I'll, I'll come in there if, if uh, uh, Patrick um, yeah I, I think the one thing that you mentioned there is the counting in the beginning and that's something that I'm really really um, guilty of um, and when I've seen certainly solo harmonica perf performances I'm thinking it should be one two three four and because you're so nervous it's like one two three four you know and you, you, you're trying to get all these notes in and i sort of got into a habit now of in my head to say you're going too fast slow down um but that doesn't always work just carry on <laughs> you know getting faster and faster so a song that's meant to last five minutes you usually get it over and done with within a don't know, minute and a half or something um <laughs> So yeah, so I've, I've certainly noticed that, and it's something I need to work on. Yeah, and Paddy, it's Pete here. Um, one thing I've noticed as well, if uh, before a gig, if I if I have no nerves at all, it's normally a disaster. I need to have some level of stress for it to work. 
So if I'm completely chilled out, it, it, go, it always goes badly wrong for me, but <clears throat> but not, not to the stage of where <clears throat> I'm completely uh, out of control and shaking, but just I need some nerves. And, and one thing that I've also learned over the years is if I try a new piece out with a band, the very first time I play that number, I, I generally get it wrong because there's no, I feel there's no sort of safety net where songs I've been playing for years and years and years, you, I know with great confidence I can play them without dropping notes, etc. But so new new pieces are always a, a difficulty as well when I when I play for the first time. Yeah, well, it's a really great point, Pete. I appreciate that because um, uh, it's really important to bear in mind that. Uh, feeling anxious, um, feeling uh, wound up about a performance is perfectly natural. In fact, it's absolutely essential. And what you just des described of uh, not, f if you don't feel any kind of nervous anticipation of your performance, then you could say that that in itself uh, is a bit of a warning sign because it could be a little bit of denial you know that actually you're you're not quite taking the situation seriously if you're not feeling a little bit aroused. Most performers, uh, um, especially professionals, w generally would say that they prefer to feel uh, just a little bit alerted up and uh, and aroused because um, that's how you give the best performance. We're going to come back to that after this slide and talk a little bit more about why it's all part of uh, a normal reaction and it goes back millions of years in evolutionary history. Here's a few more specific examples of um, the kind of um, symptoms, to, for want of a better word, that people may feel. It can be sweating, a dry mouth, heart pounding, shallow breathing, shaking or trembling, even dizziness. The most common thing is what people call butterflies which is a feeling of tension in your stomach and also a sense um, that uh, things may be moving around in your tummy. People may feel sick or nauseated. And uh, another very characteristic thing just before you go on stage is suddenly feeling that you need to go to the loo. So you should have made sure, you know, 10 minutes before that you quietly went there um, before they called you on stage. Um, now, what is it that people actually are concerned about which contribute to them feeling unusually nervous before a performance? Well, the most understandable thing, isn't it? You're going to think it's going to go badly and somehow you're going to get a bad reaction from people. Um, that's a bit global. Uh, more commonly, um, most performers will be aware that you'll have tried to prepare the whole set but in the real world um, if you're going to play a program of songs uh, say say if it's a jazz or a blues thing playing with the band you're going to do 15 16 songs there's going to be some of them that you haven't necessarily prepared that well or somewhere there may be a not you know full shared understanding with the rest of the band about how you're going to tackle it or there may even be some songs where there's a complicated bit which people haven't spent enough time on but in all the excitement of you know going to the gig and preparing that bit has been forgotten uh, people sometimes think that uh, you're going to be terrible a more personal worry is i'm not going to be able to cope so actually you can feel this sense of dread is uh, that you might walk off and i have actually um been in, uh, in performance situations where i've seen other competitors not take their cue um to actually feel so bad that they've gone up the steps and then they stopped and then they've had a quiet word with somebody and maybe gone on later when they've calmed down um there's a universal thing, I think, because we're all a bit self-critical, is thinking um, that people are going to somehow see through you. You know, the old thing about the emperor has no clothes or, or the dreams that people sometimes have of getting up in class at school and finding that your trousers have fallen round your ankles. 
you know it's this kind of sudden sense of vulnerability but because getting up on stage with a harmonica because you know harmonicas are very small it's not like having a stratocaster around your neck um it's like going into battle you know only with a dagger instead of a machine gun getting on stage with the harmonica um people can hardly even see it whereas if you've got a huge baritone saxophone you know you've got something to hold between you and the audience the next thought is that well everything went perfectly okay at home you know i could do it perfectly at home i recorded it at home but when you approach the stage you suddenly start thinking oh it's going to be a disaster you know you don't know where that thought has come from it just sometimes comes out of the blue now if um people have had previous occasions when they've experienced this then sometimes uh there will be effects long before the performance comes along and these effects they're interesting um because <clears throat> they're all about the pattern of preparation that you adopt before uh, the actual point of performance so although we're all a bit lazy and, and, and I'm sure all of us have avoided practice at some time um, sometimes nervousness can, act, can make you avoid practicing because you calm your nerves by telling yourself that you really know it when you don't really know it but you kind of soothe yourself and one way of doing that is avoiding practicing um equally well you can go to the other extreme and exhaust yourself by practicing too much obsessively practicing going over and over something so that you um you actually kill the liveliness of it you know, because you overdo it so generally uh, you can become disorganized or even start to feel um depressed or overtired worrying about what's going to go on when you worry excessively of course you can start to make misjudgments and one of the misjudgments that people often make is to overestimate the difficulty of what they're going to do because you know 95 times out of 100 it all goes well doesn't it you know and we've all had brilliant experiences getting up and performing right so that's enough of the bad stuff but the the good thing is that most of all this is perfectly natural because we've got this built-in system in our bodies called the autonomic nervous system and um, adrenaline which is been evolved over millions of years to help us with what you call fight or flight and uh, generally what <clears throat> the autonomic nervous system does is that when your mind perceives that you've got a challenge now i mean in the olden days when we were cavemen the challenge would often be a charging mammoth or something like that um rather than a harmonica performance um and the way that the auto autonomic nervous system works is that it um makes you more alert it winds up all your receptors in your brain so that all your um, sensory apparatus starts to become working on the highest possible level and then it sends out hormones to all parts of the body to prepare the body for vigorous activity and that includes for instance switching off your intestines stopping them from moving and um, so that they use less blood so the blood can be channeled to your muscles uh, and that's the reason that you get butterflies perfectly natural uh, is because your intestines have actually stopped moving and it creates this kind of strange sensation in your tummy now if we didn't have this biological response system we would have disappeared from history altogether uh, because human beings have got a fantastic capacity to rise to danger to respond to difficulty to overcome challenges uh, and uh, this fight and flight response uh, and feeling nervous is all part of that uh, so there's nothing unnatural or abnormal uh, about it 
It's just that you don't want it to be too severe because if it's too severe, then it starts uh, interfering with your ability to respond. So here's a picture of the brain just to confirm what I was saying before, that it's all taking place in there. Fear, confusion, now memory lapses. We talked about the effect on counting in that feeling a bit nervous can have. But um, time and time again, I think when you get in a rush and you've got a lot to do and you get to a gig, um, you find that you can forget things. It's easily done. It's absolutely perfectly natural. The reason that you're forgetting things is because you're focused, right? So your mind is focusing on what your mind thinks is the main issue. And for a lot of people, the main issue is walking on the stage, picking up the harmonica and starting to, 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 to blow. Um, so the fact that you've forgotten your set list, right? <laughs> um, uh, so you can't remember what the third song was, is a memory lapse. And there's a few other things going on, but I'm not going to specifically run through them all. Um, the presentation will be available afterwards if people want to look at it in more de in more detail. And some of this uh, is taken from a practice manual for music students, which I'm going to recommend. There are sections of it which are really, really helpful. Um, and there'll be a reference to that at the end. So what are the causes of performance anxiety? Well, we can look at three kind of factors. Uh, one is the person themselves, uh, their personality, their previous experience of performing. Uh, the second is the actual task itself. You know, the, 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 what, what is the nature of the performance that you're taking on? We mentioned that it could be a competition, it could be a jam session in a pub, um, it could be a, a formal paid gig, uh, depending upon the level that you're playing playing at. Um, it could be a recording session. Um, and all, all these bring with them very, very different challenges, you know, really different um, tasks that you have to respond to. Um, and then there is the situation in which you're performing the task because there's going to be a whole universe of difference between a friendly jam session in the pub um, or a wind up jazz session where nobody calls the tunes properly um, and you don't get enough preparation um, or do you know what's immediately come into my mind is that lovely video of Philip Achille playing Genevieve in the Royal Albert Hall with the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. You know, every time I see that video, I think to myself, what did Philip feel like, you know, when he walked out there to play the harmonica in the Albert Hall? Unbelievable. He, we know he performed absolutely beautifully. So the personal causes. <coughs> there's no harm in being shy there's lots and lots of shy people um and 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 many many people who are shy are fantastic performers i mean there's nothing there's and, and they may be virtuosic but they but shyness may predispose somebody to finding the performance situation you know a bit a bit challenging and the other thing is if you have a, a history, if you found that you, you've actually had experiences of full-blown um, performance nerves, then uh, uh, it's important to recognise it. You, know, you have to know yourself um, and understand yourself. And the, more, the better you know your own predispositions, the better armed you're going to be to, um, to perform. Um, there was um, an example of this was uh, I was at Trossingham at the Hona Masters um, uh, Festival and I was actually doing the guitar workshops with Eric Noden. So I was learning fingerstyle guitar right now. I bought all my harmonicas 
and um, I found the day and, and Hermione Dealu was teaching the chromatic harmonica and um, I oh no I beg your pardon that's not I wasn't doing the um, the guitar workshop I was doing Hermione Dealu's um, chromatic workshop um, and I borrowed a guitar from the guitar workshop and worked through a song with a friend um, and which I thought I knew very very well it's Nature Boy which was made famous by uh, Nat King Cole but uh, George Benson's done a fantastic example and I played it with the band and I suggested to, to Hermione Dulu that we perform it on stage um, and uh, when we got to the stage um, I had to borrow Eric Noden's guitar and the guitar that I'd been practicing with was a completely different setup. Uh, Eric Noden's guitar was set up in a very particular way for finger picking. It had a very, very high action. And um, I played a couple of chords just before going on stage and I thought, oh my God, um, it's really hard to hold the, hold the chords down on this guitar. It's a really tough guitar to play. It's got a very lovely tone. So we got on stage and I played the introduction to the song and I started singing it and Hermione started playing some harmonica behind. And I started finding that my left hand was developing cramp because of the unnatural, uh, you know, the different type of guitar. And so it wasn't a really terrible performance, but I found myself getting really dry mouthed, feeling very nervous and hoping that the whole thing would come to an end. Um, and uh, actually, you know, lost the rhythm a couple of times and then got it back and I felt I was drenched in sweat when I got off the stage and I thought to myself fancy getting up to play in public without playing your own guitar you know one way of controlling the situation and making sure there aren't unexpected threats is to be familiar you have to be familiar with the song uh, familiar with the situation you're performing it in and familiar with the instrument you're playing and to play a strange instrument is uh, is a real challenge so that was a, a real education for me so aspects of the situation will also affect the way you experience the whole thing and there may be difficult circumstances um, Public scrutiny is both a, both a source of joy and a, a source of threat. Um, it's always nice to get a good clap. Um, it's nice to come off stage feeling that you've done well and people are smiling and it's all really, 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 really cool. But playing to large audiences, um, you know, can be terrifying because when you look out and you see so many people especially if it's the first time that you've done that uh, i had the experience of singing in the london soul choir uh, three years ago for the motown review which was at the trocadero um and there were an audience of five thousand but i was one of 90 singers who were all in a big uh, row at the back of the band and then there was the band and then there was the audience so I didn't feel at all nervous, <laughs> you know, it was lovely to be in that company. But I remember uh, looking down at the band and at the singers and thinking, wow, if I was walking out to that mic in front of those 5,000 people, you know, I, I would feel very, very challenged. So public scrutiny is uh, quite a thing. Um, there may be a high degree of concern. I mean, obviously, people want to win competitions. If it's a, if there's a commercial uh, risk at stake, like a recording contract, it will be um, even more important, uh, especially for anybody who plays for money. Um, and another thing that can contribute will be if you're just basically not looking after yourself. You know, you're not getting enough sleep. You know, drinking too much, taking drugs, all the usual things. You know that we all do. <laughs> Um, task related cause this is one of my vote most familiar most popular issues here 
is what I call the overly challenging repertoire. Does anybody know what I mean by the overly challenging repertoire? Anybody got any comment on what we're talking about here is basically picking the wrong songs. Well, um, I've got a rule which I've built up over many years, and that is that um, that first of all, uh, when you think you've learned a new song, it's usually not true. Um, it, the first time you pull off a song perfectly, uh, obviously you, you have to record it to know that you've done it perfectly because your your own appraisal when you put the harmonica down you finish playing if you haven't recorded it you can't trust your judgment you you may think oh it's gone well um but it's only if you've recorded it can you tell if there are no mistakes but even if there even if there are no mistakes it doesn't necessarily mean that you fully learnt that song because um the song has to remain in your memory and you have to be able to recall it even for people who play off charts or play off mu uh, off music, um, you you still have to have a very strong memory of the song to perform it with confidence on stage. So I always say, ne ne I never trust that feeling that I know a song. What you've got to do is overlearn it. What you've got to be able to do is to uh, leave it alone for a couple of weeks and then and then play it again and then start playing it from the middle. Or you know, playing the last chorus. If it's a song that's got different sections, you know, play the sections in a different order. Um, I say that because um, a lot of people have had this experience that if you le you learn a song from beginning to end, you find that you only know it from beginning to end. Um, so if, for example, uh, you miss a bit or you come in late, you then have to uh, re-jig the song a little bit, miss out a section and try to join the song at the correct point. You can do that when you've really learned a song very confidently, but if you've only learned to play it from the start to the beginning, you will only remember it from the start to the beginning. And trying to start it in the middle just won't happen. The second sort of rule that I've discovered and um, Many teachers that I've worked with over the years, I think, tend to agree with this. And that is that in order to do a flawless performance, um, you've got to play something which is 70% or less of your best capacity. In other words, you, you don't get up and play your most difficult piece. Not only if it's in a very, very, very special situation. But if you're playing with a band and you and uh, you need to be cooperating with other people you you need to pick pieces which you're totally confident of and which are well within um your uh capacity to play and i i defend that rule i think i've seen so so often people getting up to play songs where they've taken themselves to the very limit of what they're able to achieve and I've just remembered that my own performance anxiety before starting this led me to forget to play the song that I was going to play. So maybe I'll play it at the end if we've got time. The next thing that can contribute, which is pretty obvious, is uh, insufficient practice. Um, and um, that may seem very, very obvious, but sometimes uh, it does require a clear mindedness to make sure that you apportion enough time to rehearsing different aspects of the same song. It may be that people have got uh, a weakness in their practice skills. Now, that, there's a whole book that we could write about that. We probably haven't got time today, but it's really largely about whether or not you have a practice routine, whether or not it's regular, uh, and whether or not it's systematic. In other words, that it covers all the different angles that you need in order to be able to learn a set of songs and to be able to perform them. 
And then there is a thing called performance skills, which is uh, not just about holding the harmonica in the right way and playing the right notes, but it's also about how you conduct yourself on stage, uh, how you mentally manage yourself, uh, and how you how you present yourself. Even for example, how you you know how you make a little introduction and and, and make a rapport with the audience at the beginning. So what are we aiming for? Well, of course, we're not all going to be masters. It's a pity. Um, but it's something I think that we're all aiming for and you will carry on, you know, it's always best to be aiming for it, not giving up. Um, but whether you get there or not is a entirely other question. But what what is mastery? Would anybody like to give their definition of what is it like you know to be a top player what is it what is it about the top players professionalism really i suppose you could say knowing, knowing music and um playing the right notes at the right time i suppose you know yeah, yeah, that's right. Playing the right notes at the right time. I'm just trying to spot who who was that. Oh, sorry, Patrick. It is Steve. Hi, Steve. Right. Hi, Hi. mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've, playing I've, the right I've, notes. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been on the stage. With, playing them with what style? What characteristic? Uh, with feeling. Well, I was, feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Feeling, yeah, fe yeah. Feeling. Yeah. Feeling. Because I mean, you can read music as like a like a robot, but is putting feeling into the music itself. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Like you have to, you have, you have to show the audience that you're actually enjoying what you're doing, and you, yeah. you have to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, uh, uh, give out, give out the the vibes that this is all about what you love, and you love this tune, you love the band, you love the audience. In fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. this point, showing that you're enjoying yeah. yourself is probably. Yeah one of the most important steps and it's a step to something which i call and gerald clickman who wrote the book that a lot of this is based on call ease e-a-s-e -E. and that the great characteristic of all virtuoso performers is that they play with ease and what is ease well ease is a very very funny thing because um, the main characteristic of all top performers is that they don't appear to make much of an effort. It's really, really, but you, you just look, you know, get some YouTube videos out, look at your favorite top performers. They play brilliantly, but they make it appear that there is practically no real effort going into it. They may occasionally raise an eyebrow during a difficult passage, um, but um, they will never show any sign that they are struggling. Um, and that's almost completely universal, and that's called ease. It's called playing with ease, and it's quite different from just playing well. Um, I've played well on many occasions, but when I've watched videos of myself, um, I can always tell that I'm showing signs of making an effort, you know. Um, when I see myself looking very relaxed, then I really love it, you know, because the music always sounds much better too. I don't mean over relaxed, you know, uh, or tired and emotional. Um, I mean, relax. so ease is the capacity to play difficult things and to make it appear that you're enjoying yourself, you're relaxed, and you're not really making any effort at all. You know, went to see Antonio Serrano at Pizza Express last year. Um, Antonio's got got it. E, you know, he plays with ease. He looks as though he's just at home with his family. You know, just relaxed in front of the band, and every note sounds full of ease. Uh, it's a very, I think it's a very, very hard thing to achieve 
um, and it's something they spend an awful lot of time in music academies is trying to teach their pupils to play uh, to play with ease. Paddy, there's a couple of questions just come into the chat which are quite good. Yeah, okay. If you if, do, you want to have a look at those? Yeah, let's have a look. Yeah. You know, I can't see the chat with my presentation in front of me. Okay. Um, can you? One. Uh, I think I might have to stop. Okay. This. Um, one um uh, from from Grouch's iPhone. <laughs> Um, could you address my situation of being totally confident performing in front of 5,000 people, but being very fearful of playing in front of five people? Who made that point? Um, I don't know. Who, who, who is Grouch? Grouch that's from Gr Grouch's iPhone. I don't know who Grouch is. is. Well, I would say, Fiddler, you're a very lucky person, Groucho. Um, I, I, I would stick to the big gigs. Um because if you're at ease in front of 5,000 people, but you're uncomfortable in um, small, smaller crowds, then it may be that you need to speak to your manager to make sure that you just get those very big performances. More seriously, it may be that it's the closest scrutiny from a small group. Uh, but, you know, the thing um, I remember when I, after I retired, I cycled to Istanbul, taking a bag of harmonicas. And when I got to Charleroi, there was a festival taking place in the... Um, in the <coughs> and uh, the guy was playing Isn't She Lovely? So I got up with the harmonica and he put me straight on the mic. And, um, and uh, played Isn't She Lovely? And we got an encore and we played it again. And there was there was about three four thousand people there, uh, but you could hardly see them because you know it was dark. There were big lights on stage, and uh, everybody was drinking wine and beer, and everybody was very relaxed. And I never noticed any nerves. Um, but if uh, on my birthday, um, when a friend came round to play on the piano, and there were seven people in the dining room, I felt really nervous. Uh, it was because everybody's much closer, aren't they? And you're under closer scrutiny and you feel people's opinions being formed, you know, more deeply than maybe with a whole crowd of 5,000. I don't know if that answers your question. What do you think? Uh, well, that that was from Ken. We, he, Ken's okay. re, re, he's renamed himself. Uh, okay. Ken, I don't know if you want to press your space bar and you can speak to Paddy. Uh, let's see. Can you hear me now? I can, yeah. Okay. The, I, I, well, that does answer my question. I appreciate it uh, um, uh, because I've been performing off and on my entire life in different situations, and I've played festivals with 5,000, 10,000 people and never had a problem. But if, if I get into a living room with three or four or five people, I have all those performance anxiety uh, uh characteristics that, that you, you speak about and it's just an interesting situation for me yeah and I don't have a manager to speak to maybe that'll be the, the key is to find a manager <laughs> <laughs> Ken where are you speaking from I'm from Bloomfield Connecticut oh well, very welcome thank you making the Atlantic seem very small yes yes or, or maybe the problem is is that the audiences here in the states are just a little more critical of me maybe I should Maybe I should move to England. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People, people are really relaxed over here. <laughs> that talk about large arenas uh, reminds me um, of a sort of um, Christmas quiz question that I often pose, which is, who is the harmonica player uh, who's played to the biggest worldwide audience ever? Any guesses, anybody? Toots. Uh, I, I, I'd say Toots. Oh, okay. that's, a good, that's a good suggestion, yeah. Any more? Larry. Larry. Any oh, more? Yeah. Had yeah, yeah. Who? Larry Hadler. Larry no. Hadler, okay. Right. Yeah. You, I, nobody said Stevie Wonder. I would have thought he was the guy. Oh, that uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because Stevie's, you know, done uh, huge uh, TV concerts. But actually, yeah. um, I think Jimmy Zed, who was a harmonica player with the Eurythmics, 
because he played on the main stage at Live Aid uh, when they had uh, 1.2 billion people watching. And uh, he played Missionary Man on a G diatonic harp. And check it out on YouTube. It's one of the most incredible rock solos on the harmonica you'll ever hear. It's absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. And in that, I'll return to my subject, looking at the time. Uh, we'll, we'll do another five minutes and then we'll take some questions. So we're going to get on to what to do about it. So um, here we are. I got over my performance anxiety. So now I'm just back to plain old anxiety. So what is the, uh, the, the way to tackle all this? Um, well, I'm going to sort of run through a whole lot of things in a little bit of detail. We won't dwell too much on, on the detail. Some of the things will seem very obvious and I would emphasize to people that it's actually the, the whole thing. You can take individual things from the menu, but the way to tackle this problem is by having a rounded program that looks at all the corners. So, um, oops. So, um, checking up on your uh, performance skills. Um, so, uh, there's five sides of performance preparation which I think are really important. You first, do you decide what your songs are going to be? And you bear in mind the rule, which is that if you're going to play with ease and mastery, you've got to choose music which you are completely in charge of uh, and very confident of. You have to have a practice routine and you have to actually apportion time for practice. You have to think about your presentation style. Um, on the technical side, um, there's the uh, actual technical business of practicing the particular uh, program that you've chosen. Then on equipment, um, it's really important to make sure that you list and prepare all the equipment that you're using. Now, harmonica players that use amplifiers and um, and uh, microphones and stuff, you know, are fully familiar with this. You have to make sure you've got a little torch so that you can find your harmonica on stage in the right key. Make sure that you've got your set lists. You need lots of checklists to make sure that you've got everything. Studying the venue and looking at the stage is a luxury for touring musicians, but most of us who've got a gig booked weeks ahead, you know, should be able to go along and actually check out the venue and see how the whole thing's set up. I've played three or four times at Oliver's Wine Bar in Greenwich on a Friday night. It's a great gig, it's a, but it's an underground like nightclub thing where the stage is absolutely tiny and the number, uh, a number of the PowerPoints don't work. Um, uh, so you have to check out that you don't plug your amplifier into a PowerPoint that doesn't work. Um, you have to be very careful that your amp doesn't fall off the front of the stage because the stage is so small. So uh, it's really worth knowing the layout in the venue. Mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is very popular uh, in today's world. I've been getting into it big time. It's really important. Um, it's a great way of making yourself feel feeling feel calm. Uh, it's based, basically based upon breathing exercises, uh, very simple breathing exercises where you you just learn to control your breath, and it's a fantastic way of controlling nerves. Your personal motivation is really important. It's very good to say to yourself. Um, why you're doing so. I'm, I'm playing because I love these people. I'm playing because I really like this music. You know, I'm playing these songs which I love. You know, these are what people call positive attributions. Uh, you make a positive state. It may, may sound silly to even say it out, line, out, loud, to your, out loud to yourself. Um, but if you do it just to yourself, it really helps your motivation. A lot of people find that visualizing the performance beforehand is a really good way of practicing. You can do this on the bus. You can do it in bed. It's just a question of, in your mind, imagining the situation, imagining walking up to the mic, imagining picking the right harmonica, and imagining playing the song, even imagining where the holes on the harmonica are. You can actually close your eyes and see a picture 
of a 10 hole or 12 hole harmonica in front of your eyes and just imagine where the holes are. These are all ways of preparing yourself mentally for your performance. Physical health, making sure that you're well hydrated um, and uh, that you're getting enough sleep is all part of the routine. Now there's a stack of practical things that you have to bear in mind. Um, I mean, I usually lead the arrangements with my band, so I have to look after all the confirming of the booking with the venue, making sure transport arrangements. All, all these things can cause things to go wrong. Um, especially if people turn up late. I mean, uh, my band, we did a gig at the Langham Hotel in Mayfair, accompanying um, uh, the, the hotel plays, where they were doing Tennessee Williams Hotel Plays, and in between these 45 minute plays, people came to the bar and we played to them. And when we uh, got there 15 minutes before, the PA system wouldn't work. And um, there were, there'd been a power outage in the hotel, but only a partial one. And um, we didn't manage to get the PA system to work until two minutes before we were due to go on stage. So we had so, no sound check. So when we started playing, we were far too loud and everybody was going ah, ah, you know, like this. Um, we got it by the third number. We got we got we got it down. Uh, but I was cursing that I hadn't come an hour before the performance to check that the power was all working properly. OK, there's lots more practical things. Stefan Grappoli always said, you have to prepare yourself really carefully. Make sure your violin is properly polished. Um, he makes sure that he has a good diet and he's in the theatre one hour before the performance. And then he's not distracted by anything. So you have, it's useful to have a pre-performance routine. Um, taking some light exercise in the hours before a performance is very helpful. Being cautious about alcohol and drugs. I mean, generally I found that a half pint of beer is the maximum that I can manage before a performance. But a little half pint does sometimes help just to relax me a little bit. For a lot of people avoiding alcohol altogether. I've been at performances of my band where at half time I've seen, every, I've seen several members of the band throwing pints of lager down. And I felt a little bit annoyed, you know, and I thought we're being paid for this. And you know we've got to we've got to stay together, and it you know it looks a bit over relaxed. Now there's a thing about your attitude. There was a, I played with a great uh, trumpet bebop trumpet player Tom Spencer, who was also my tutor for a few years ago, and um, Tom had this thing called game face, uh, which is that uh, when you look, when you're on stage you look positive. It doesn't mean that you always have a big toothy grin, although some people like to have a big toothy grin, but you try, you look good. You look, com you know, you look confident and in charge, cheerful and composed, and you speak to people in a cheerful way and you smile because people have found, you know, that this is the best atmosphere to try to create on stage. I'm not going to labour the stuff about transport and things at the venue, but we've all forgotten crucial things. One tiny story that I'm reminded of is like one of the worst challenges that I ever came across, but which I overcome, overcame with no difficulty. We were doing a charity gig in Forest Hill at the All in One pub, and I'd helped set up the stage. When I opened my harmonica box, the harmonica box was filled with shards of broken glass. I was absolutely appalled. I was, and then I realised that uh, Julian Jackson had advised me that a really good way of lubricating the slide on a chromatic harmonica was to have a little bottle of water with a, um, a spray head and to spray where the slide meets the harmonica. And I'd put a glass bottle of water in the box 
and on the way to the gig it had smashed. And this wasn't just like inconvenient, I was suddenly faced with the possibility that if I played a harmonica which had broken glass inside it, I would puncture my lung and be taken to hospital as an emergency. So in the 10 minutes before the performance, I had to rush to the gents' toilet and wash all the harmonicas and dry them. So I just had to do deep breathing and mindfulness and just get on with it. We, I managed to get on stage with a minute to spare and everything was okay. But it was like one of the most frightening experiences of my life. So even backstage, terrible things can happen. I'm going to scoot over this. Here's a harmonica work plan. This is just an example of having a practice schedule and trying to stick to it in a reasonably routine way. So this is a way of covering new material, developing material. So you start with a new song, you think you've learnt it, then you call it developing material and you try to refine it, you maybe play it faster and then you try to memorise it. And then you start to practice performing now, practicing performing means that you don't stop playing. When you're, when you're practicing in your music room, you know, quite often what you'll do is you'll stop a song when you come to a difficult part and then you'll fiddle around with it and then you'll restart it. But a performance rehearsal is where you take five songs and you play them back to back and you don't stop. In other words, you're practicing performance and uh, it's really important it's no it's just as important to practice performance as it is to practice uh, scales so there we are i think we've come to the end i'd like to recommend if you want to do some more reading there's a book called the musician's way a guide to practice by gerald klipstein it's also available on kindle and it's got a lot more detail in it about practice routines uh, and preparation which apply to any kind of instrument. So I thank you for your attention. We've got a little bit of time for questions now. Um, Paddy, if I can make an observation, it's Pete again here, by the way. Um, uh, I've done quite a few performances where I've performed on a, on a stage in a theatre. And um, the first time I went on stage really surprised me because of all the lighting, you can't actually see past row three because you know, if there's a, an upper circle, a dress circle, all you can see is the first three rows of the stalls. So the, 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 the um, theatre could be completely empty. You, you can't see them. And yeah. when you see people like um, Tony Bennett and things at, at the Royal Albert Hall looking up, he can't actually see anyone. It's, it's, it's just a bit of a fake stage view he's doing. Um, and maybe this maybe this is something that could answer Ken's question because in, in theatres, all you're seeing is the first three rows here. You're only seeing a few dozen people. It's impossible to see the rest of the theatre. So it doesn't feel like a big gig. You know, and I've been in some big theatres, some 1,500 seat theatres where, where I've been in a, in a one-man show, but you just can't see the people. So that that's quite a comfort blanket for me, the fact I've only seen a few dozen people. Yeah. Good, interesting point. But you can you may not be able to hear them, but you can see them. But you can hear them. You can hear them, yeah, yeah. So if they boo, you'll hear. Yeah, them. I hear them booing quite a lot. But they're... <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, there's another couple of points, Paddy, that I've thought of that have happened to me. Certainly given me uh, some anxiety on stage. Well before going on stage is where you um, turn up for the gig and the main man has decided to change the set list. Yeah. So you've got it all set up with all your all in the right order with all your harmonica keys and so on and so on. And um, I find that a little bit stressful. Yeah. Yeah. If you're I play uh, quite often with Carmen Carr and the Red Roosters uh, and it's a Chicago blues set. And um, uh, as the harmonica player, you simply have to accept any arrangements which are made because you are a bit low in the pecking order in the blues band, <laughs> unless you're the star, unless you're a vocalist and you're leading. If you're, if you're a sideman and uh, Carmen is a magnificent singer, mm. uh, so you, you, just, you just have to learn to be calm and take anything that comes. Yes, yeah, I appreciate that, yeah. Yeah, you have to be flexible, <laughs> don't you? Yes. 
what about seeing someone's sort of friendly face in the crowd? Would that help? I was always told when I was I saw on stage a couple of times, and someone said to me, if you look for a friendly face and sing to them, sometimes that can help. Have you ever found that? Or is that... That's, that's a really, really, really good tip. And um, it's also said that um, if you're in a competition, um, you should uh, imagine the um, judges in their underwear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just looking at the um, the chat line to see if we've handled everybody's. Um, some people say no audio. Right. Okay. I don't think there's anything outstanding on the chat line. Can I make just, just sort of mention about? Um, I think one one of the biggest fears, certainly for me, was was making mistakes. Um, so when I started play, playing bass for the band kind of about 12, 15 years ago, um, I was sort of there constantly thinking, right, I can't make any mistakes here, you know, that this, I've got every, every note right. And then after a while I realised that actually it's only you who really know, know, unless it's a really bad mistake, but it's only you know where the, where the little dodgy notes are here and there. And that's playing harmonica as well, you know. Um, and in a way, you can you once you realise, well, actually, you can get get away with a few little mistakes here and there. You can then sort of enjoy yourself playing more, and you sort of ease up, and then you perhaps you find that your playing is actually better than um, than sort of being very sort of stiff and you know watching you watching your fingers all the time. Um, and, and I think I think it's it's how you how we each deal with things as well, isn't it? Because yeah. um, and Ken mentioned about playing in front of uh, what it was five thousand people. I mean, I I was depping for a band and it was a festival and there was like three thousand people there. So I thought, bloody hell, right? Okay, there's a lot of people there. But my attitude was wasn't um, oh right, I, I'm you know I, I'm absolutely crapping myself here. It was, this is probably the, the only opportunity I'm going to have playing in front of all these people. And it was sort of in the daylight, in daylight anyway. I thought, I'm, I'm going, to, going to enjoy this. And that, that was the thing in my head, thinking, no, look, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm, I'm not going to sort of um, sort of feel overly nervous and let that tension come through my playing. So it's, I suppose every, everyone's different, aren't they? I think it's the point I'm trying to get across. Yes. I think this point about focusing on somebody who's familiar and friendly uh, that does. I think that works. That's a good tip, um, because um, because that that will be very very reassuring. And then this point about mistakes. There's obviously you know fantastically big discussions about mistakes. There's two schools of thought on mistakes. One is that mistakes don't matter, and the other is that mistakes are catastrophic, and there's hardly anybody in between. Most, um, I, I had, uh, I was trying to improve my music reading a couple of years ago and I had some weekly lessons with Gwyn Pritchard, who's a, a composer and professor of music. And um, we were doing flute pieces and he absolutely insisted all the time that I didn't stop when I made a mistake. And it was like the main thing he tried to teach me in, in the lessons that reading the music, um, that n if you made a mistake, you must move to the next bar, pick up the melody line in time and carry on. Don't grimace, don't draw attention to, to the mistake. And I think that that is the conventional and mostly successful approach in music schools. And that is all mistakes can be minimized mm. and they're minimized usually by the player using their familiar familiarity to to pause maybe to mute playing I and mean, adam glasser always uh, teaches people to mute playing you know it, it's quite a clever technique to actually uh play not play but not play in time do you see what i mean so you stop blowing the harmonica, but you mentally follow the melody and then you re-enter as soon as you're confident that you're going to be correct. 
And when you do that effectively, it's often only a microsecond that passes by since the error. And hardly any audiences ever notice that kind of error. Yeah. The sort of mistake which people do notice is if you continue to play in the wrong key. Uh, uh, I mean, people who play, generally this won't happen in a blues because uh, it might sound wonky, but it won't sound completely out of tune. But in many uh, stand, jazz standards, the, the, the middle section will change key. And if you forge on for a couple of bars without changing key, you'll start to sound terrible. Um, so you have to learn to be able to pick up your mistakes. Don't worry about making mistakes because we all make them. The real trick is recognizing a mistake quickly and responding to it. And when you learn to do that, and they, uh, all professional musicians do it, you just minimize the mistake and carry on. Don't allow yourself to be upset. Don't, don't have a tantrum and then you know stamp your feet, throw your harmonica on the ground and say, oh, it's terrible, I can't play. But you know, that's the opposite of what you want to do. Any more questions? I yeah, I just, just wanted to make a point. I don't generally get nervous before gigs unless I'm playing with a new band and it's the first time. But I did notice that when, um, uh, because I've always considered that, you know, with, with music, when it's performance, if you do make a mistake, the moment's gone, it's passed on. Yeah. Whereas when you started getting people using their phones to video gigs, all mm. of a sudden it's captured forever. <laughs> that, that you, do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, now, obviously, where everyone does it, it's it's less relevant because people generally don't watch the stuff so much. But at first, that added an extra element. I found I was taking less risks, yeah. you know, as, as a I was yeah. a bass player mainly at, at the time. But yeah. the other the other advantage of being a bass player is if you if you do play a wrong note, then you just glare at the guitar player and everyone thinks it's them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're making a really important point because in today's world. A copyright of YouTube videos is a really, really hot issue because um, uh, lots of professional musicians who may, for example, jam or, or, or play informally with other people do not want those those YouTube videos uploaded, uh, showing them playing in, in less than spectacular company. Um, yeah, we at the Langham Hotel gigs that we did, we had a pro drummer who a uh, very talented, uh, unusually woman drummer, uh, uh, very, very highly trained, also played timpani in a classical or orchestra. And um, it was proposed by the manager of the hotel that they would pay for us to be videoed. And I thought, fantastic opportunity to have a really high quality video. Mm -hmm. But we, we were playing for no money and we were paying the drummer professional fees but we were we, we were paying her out of our own pockets we were only getting the gig for love so of course she was a musicians union member she refused to be videoed with us because she didn't want us to upload a video uh on youtube of her playing with a band that was not being paid yeah she just didn't want it um so there's a there's, there's many different reasons but um Having your mistakes uploaded to, to, to YouTube without your permission is a little bit of an invasion of privacy. Yeah, they, they mostly sort of, um, you know, informal pub gigs sort of thing um, and sort of medium sized venues. Yeah, where it doesn't, it doesn't really matter so much. But if yeah. you're building an online reputation and you're selling records, then you, you'll have more strong feelings about that issue. I'm glad you yeah. brought it up. It's a really interesting point. Yeah, it sort of did add to the anxiety for me at first, but so, yeah, yeah. I can thanks, buddy. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Mm. Mm. Okay, sh should we leave it there and then perhaps you can play us out with with a tune or two, Patrick? Okay, then, right. Um, be before we do, just mention, sort of, thank everyone for coming coming along and supporting um, supporting us again. Great numbers um, as usual. Um, next up, chromatic um, player Alberto Veraldo. Um, I say I must confess. Confess I haven't followed up um, to ask him what his subject is, 
but it's probably either going to be um, uh, either classical or, or Brazilian jazz, so perhaps a bit of samba or, or coro. So that um, that sort of ties in nicely with last week with uh, with the Argentine tango. So perhaps this time next year we'll done a we will have done a full tour of South America and Latin music. So um, and then after that I, I, I'm doing a little uh, uh, a Christmas session. So um, uh, so I'll probably just do a little bit at the beginning, a couple of a few little ideas, and after that, I invite people to play their own Christmas songs. So that um, Christmas jumpers and and uh, um, hats, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's sort of welcome, but not uh, not obligatory. So um, anyway, so we'll see you next week. Well, and... Sam, Sam, do you mind if I say something very quickly? Go on then. Go on then, please. Uh, um, can I just thank you, Sam? This is a, it, we're nine months into lockdown session, and Sam gives up every Saturday for us, so it, it is very much appreciated. So thank you very much, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, Paddy, this has been a fascinating subject. I don't know if people know or you meant to be in it, but Paddy is a psychiatrist. That's right, isn't it, Paddy? That's right. Well, I was, yeah. Yeah, well, so he's very, very qualified to talk on this subject. And Thanks it's very much. Been, it's been an absolutely fascinating uh, workshop so thank you Paddy okay thank you it's been very I'm glad really... you're all coming along fantastic <laughs>